hello! My name is Mara and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Okay guys, this is it! We have reached the end of the new novels for us to talk about because today I am reviewing Curtain, which is the last Hercule Poirot novel. Now, we need to have a important disclaimer here, which is normally my Project Poirot reviews are spoiler free. So if you, for some reason, have clicked on this video as opposed to any of the other ones in this series, normally I do spoiler free reviews. I'll take you in a synopsis of roundabouts where you find a body, um, talk about some character details, but I want, to, I, the purpose of these reviews has been to share some of my thoughts, to do some kind of like analysis and talk about social history. And hopefully if you've never read one of the books before, it entices you to read it. That's been sort of the goal. However, this is the final book in the series. There is a major, major event in this that I don't think we could talk about this book without getting into that. Like, I think it would not be a good review if I didn't talk about that. And frankly, you shouldn't start this series with this book. So I feel comfortable giving spoilers for this. Before I do spoilers, I will just give you my high level opinion, which is I was surprised at how much I enjoyed this book. I think that it's actually an extremely moving book in a lot of ways. And I'm not sure if it's the best ending to the series, but it was a very emotional read for me that I enjoyed. So that is sort of my spoiler free thought. If you have not read this book, please click off now because I'm going to get into spoilers and I really want you to enjoy this book as unspoiled as possible. So goodbye if you've not read this. If you have read it, let's continue. I think for this review, I really am just gonna kind of go, like I made little notes, um, of my thoughts as I was going and I kind of feel like I'm just gonna just kind of go through the book um, and give you some of the things that I wrote down as I was experiencing it. I'm not really gonna do much of a synopsis because if you've read this book you know what happens. Uh, just as a quick refresh if it's been a while, um, Hastings is reunited with Poirot so the last time we saw him in a novel I believe was in Dumb Witness which was I think like maybe the 16th book. So it has been a hot minute. It's been a very long time um, since Hastings has shown up in one of these. And so he's back, he's the narrator. Poirot has written to him from Styles Court, which if you will remember was the uh, pl the country house where the very first Poirot novel took place. And he has asked him to come join him. There's a lot of people staying at the house. Uh, it's now a guest house run by the Luttrells, I believe is their name. And uh, there's a, a variety of different characters staying there, one of whom Poirot believes to be a murderer. Um, among the guests is also Hastings' youngest daughter. So we get a lot of like family things happening because of that. And the big thing that happens in this book, and I should say, I kind of knew the spoiler for this, but didn't fully know what the context was. Um, Poirot, dies at the end of this book. <laughs> um, so it is d a definitive ending in that respect. Um, he dies uh, in in pursuit of uh, getting justice uh, f to kind of take down this one last killer. So that's kind of if you if it's been a while since you've read it, that's sort of the contours of the story. Um, so I'll just tell you some of my thoughts as as they were occurring to me. Okay, so I think the thing that stuck with me most about this book is how the mystery itself is almost wholly uninteresting to me. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say I didn't care at all, but I'm going to say that this book was so emotional for me. I, I was just so moved by it and it really starts from almost the first page because you learn very quickly that Hastings' beloved wife, Cinderella, who is either, I think her real name is either Bella or Dulcie, I can't remember. But anyway, she has died in the Argentine. She's buried. And really a huge piece of this book, in my opinion, is Hastings mourning the loss of his wife, who is such a huge sort of like balancing force for him. And preparing himself to say goodbye to Poirot because Poirot, when Hastings arrives, is just in terrible condition. He is confined to a wheelchair. He, you know, he's always been sort of like portly. Um, he's like kind of withered away. His hair is very clearly like dyed or something. Um, his mustaches are dyed. Like he's just like, and he, he keeps having a series of heart attacks. So he is essentially like on the brink of death. And so to me, what I loved about this book was that I felt like it was really just an exploration of saying goodbye and grief and what it looks like to have 
certain parts of your life be over and how you find meaning going forward. Maybe I'm reading too much into this or maybe because I'm ending some time, my time with Poro, I was, I was inclined to feel this way. And you know, I've been dealing with grief myself in the last year or two. Um, I had a really, a very good friend die just very unexpectedly from a, a previously unknown medical condition. So processing that and then my dad has been very sick. So kind of grieving the process of having somebody you love be ill and losing parts of their selves and parts of their life that that are, are just in the past now. So it might be that just because of that, I was very attuned to those parts of the novel. But to me, I actually really didn't care that much about the mystery and was very focused on like, oh, like John Cavendish, who we met in that very first book is of course, he's dead, like he's gone. And Cinders is gone. And, and, and Hastings has these adult children now who he a lot of the book is about him trying to relate to his youngest daughter and um, just the passage of time and realizing, like a meditation on the fact that things change. And I think the fact that she did bring her characters back to styles for me, just really underline that. And there's a lot of discussion in this book about styles being haunted or this idea of if somebody is murdered in a place, does that always stay with, with the place where that happened? And I think, and may, again, maybe I'm just giving her too much credit, but to me, thematically, that kind of felt like the, the ghosts of your past are always kind of there. And when you're in certain places, that kind of comes up more. And you have Hastings, like, through that, we then get an examination of our relationship to the past. And Hastings, when he first is coming, is sort of romanticizing like, oh, I, you know, I was so young and I remember, you know, he kind of makes an ass of himself over, uh, what's her name? Cynthia, I think is her name, uh, the, the Auburn <laughs> girl in that story. Cause you know, Hastings always has to kind of fall in love with whoever the Auburn woman is um, around the Auburn haired woman. Um, and in that book, I believe her name was Cynthia. Um, and kind of think he's, you know, kind of romanticizing that and thinking about just like, this is when he met Poirot and all that stuff. and. You know, there's a very specific um, discussion in the book about how he comes to realize, because people keep saying like, was it a happy house? And he finally is able to really just like, he, it kind of comes up a few times, but he kind of cements in his own mind like, that wasn't a happy house. Like everybody was under the thumb of Mrs. Inglethorpe. She had been, you know, she was murdered, but she also married this man who like married her to kill her. Um, you know, the John and Mary's marriage was very unhappy. Lawrence is pining after Cynthia and he's never getting her. Like he, he realizes that, and you know, he was really depressed because he's been injured out of the war and he's feeling like his manhood questioned and stuff. There's like a direct meditation on that. And Poirot also reminds him like, when I was here, it was the worst time of my life because I was injured. He was, he has like a limp and he was injured in the war and I was a refugee away from home living with all these other people. It was, I had no money, I had no resources. So I think there's a real kind of interrogation of the past, but what I love is that she kind of brings that full circle and amidst all of this sort of like kind of heavier things, Agatha Christie can't help but try to give people a happy ending. I think that's just like a part of her writerly DNA is she always wants to give people at least some glimmer of hope. And Poirot, you know, he talks about how that was a dark time. And he said, but how would I, you know, how could I know that I would make this country my home and that I would have you as this wonderful friend and that I would, you know, build this life that was so meaningful me meaningful for me after my retirement. So he reflects on that. And Hastings at the end of the book, I think we have an indication from Poirot that like, he has found um, a lady that he possibly could settle down with. And, you know, there's hope for him to move on. So I think Agatha Christie wants to give us a little bit of hope by the end. But it is just like a really sentimental, probably, but in a way that worked for me, um, book about grief. And uh, I just, from that perspective, I adored this book. <laughs> Now, I do think that this does not work that well as a mystery. Um, so <sighs> Poirot, I, essentially the mechanics of how this wraps up, I think are just contrived and like a little bit of nonsense. So Poirot refuses to tell Hastings the person who he knows to be a murderer. And at the end of the book, 
you somewhat have that justified because Poirot essentially gets Hastings there to be a witness to pull off the murder that Poirot is going to commit. Um, <clears throat> so that makes a little more sense at the end of the book. But as like a setup, it's a very frustrating experience for the reader because you're like, Poirot, what is wrong with you? Like this is, it just doesn't, the way she communicates that doesn't quite ring true. Maybe you could look, that, look at that as a clue that Poirot is overacting and that something weird is up with him. You possibly could read it that way, but it, it doesn't feel great. And then I just didn't buy, because I think what she's what the text directly says and what she's wanting to sell to us is this idea that um, this was Poirot's greatest nemesis, that like this was the big person, like the, the most dastardly murderer we've ever encountered. It's, you know, if you don't remember, it was Norton. Um, and that he essentially murders by manipulating people kind of like actually now that I'm thinking about this this reminds me of the first episode of Sherlock like I think that's what we're meant to believe it doesn't work in that first episode of Sherlock in my opinion and it also doesn't work here I just don't buy that as like a credible modus operandi so that kind of undermines the entire mystery for me once that's revealed now i do think that in terms of the kind of suspense aspect of who's gonna die like who's going to be murdered who is the murderer i mean that worked pretty well throughout the novel and what i knew about this ending was that poirot in some way committed suicide to protect Hastings or his daughter I couldn't I never quite knew what and now that I see like so I kind of knew that that was end game here so maybe that also spoils things a little bit but I did enjoy the sort of like suspense of is Hastings daughter directly one of the murderers like is she in on it or is she is she the murderer um I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that um just be, based on what I knew about the story and I do like the idea that Poirot um, essentially like kind of recognizes that his time is up and that he, I think I think what we're meant to take from this in some ways is this idea that he like waited until it was time for him to go and kind of gives himself up because he loves Hastings and he loves Hastings family. So I think in terms of reinforcing this idea of Poirot really loving Hastings and truly like, I, for, I think it's in the big four. I forget exactly which one it is, but in one of the books, Poirot gives like this really beautiful speech about how lucky he is to have Hastings as a friend and what a beautiful nature Hastings had. Like, so I liked that in the sense of it felt like kind of full circle on their relationship, but I just think that it's really kind of just hard to reckon with as somebody who's read all of these novels now that Poirot would kill someone. It just didn't quite work for me and Poirot in his final letter even addresses it kind of directly and says like you know I don't approve of murder so this might be surprising to you but like here's why I feel like I have to do this and this is you know I am not above the law but I was a, once a part of the law um so it's okay for me to do this and like it's very self-justify and maybe you know maybe that's you know what one would tell oneself if one was going to do this, but it just didn't quite work for me. So like I said, the mystery part of this, while I enjoyed the buildup of it throughout the novel, and I appreciate the ingenuity of the solution in terms of like, when we find out what's what, I think the murderer himself is so unsatisfying to me and Poirot, in my opinion, is acting so out of character that it just didn't quite work for me. And that's that to me is the biggest detraction from this book. And considering it is a mystery novel, like that's a big objection to have. So like in that sense, in some ways, this book is a little bit of a failure. <laughs> And I will say this book was originally written during um, the Second World War. So Agatha Christie would have been mid 50s ish. And uh, it was written essentially because she was afraid that she was going to die in the war. <laughs> and she wanted to make sure if that happened that there was a, an ending to the Poirot books. Um, that being said, from what I was reading, it sounds like scholars are pretty sure that she went back and was tinkering with the manuscript when, when she was in her uh, 70s and 80s. And there are moments where I think they're probably right about that. Like I see why there's some feeling that that's what happened because I do think we get this whole theme that she's had in her last few books about um, mothers or daughters needing a mother. Like that's a big theme is that Hastings doesn't know how to be a parent. Like he feels very at sea about how to be a good parent to his daughter and keeps thinking about how she, you know, if, if my wife was here, she would know what to do and, you know, 
Judith, like my daughter needs her mother. So I think that that's definitely there. And I think in some of the chattiness and some of the dialogue, I do also wonder if that, those were kind of like later interpolations or later rewrites. So I don't always think it's like the strongest book uh, in that respect either. So there, there are definitely some problems with this. And for people who don't like this book, and I know that there are plenty who do feel like this was not that great of one, I completely see that. Uh, I, I acknowledge that. I think for me, there were so many just little moments that I connected with on an emotional level that I was pretty forgiving of a lot of that stuff. But you know, maybe I shouldn't have been. Maybe I should have been a little harsher um, on on some of the aspects of this novel that don't work. But in general, I just I just enjoyed it. I can't help myself. I really did just enjoy this. But yeah, I mean, I think for me, I pretty much found this to be a novel that I would I would think of as a novel of dread, kind of in the way that maybe I don't know, maybe like and then there were none in terms of I feel like there's a lot of like build up of what's going to happen. There's a there's a lot of dread that she builds up. And then it's that and then also this novel of letting go. I just I think I feel like those things were enough to keep me engaged and excited about what was going on and just really emotionally connected to these characters that I haven't been in a while. Like, I do think, you know, Elephants Can Remember, I think gave me some of these feels because in a lot of ways, it felt like a final novel. Um, but now that I see this and see what the actual last novel is, I think I what I if I were Agatha Christie, if I were in charge, having written um, the book, having written Curtain, I think maybe what I would have done with the, or the Poirot world was once I realized that the world Curtain was written in was so different from the modern world, I think I may have started setting all of my novels in the past. What I mean by that is I think that if this book because ostensibly, in theory, it's set in 1975, because that's when it was finally published, but it was written in the 40s. I think if maybe she had started setting her books starting in maybe like the mid 50s, in the the 40s or the early 50s, essentially, like when this world, the world we see in curtain no longer matched in any way the reality of her current time, I think maybe those last books would have been a little more successful because she would have avoided a lot of the sort of weird moralizing and like as much as I enjoy her take on like the hippies and stuff, um, I think maybe those books would have been just better books if she had sort of written in this world longer. Um, so that's sort of my take in terms of it as an ending is that I really like it as a book and it does feel like a fitting ending. I do think if you're reading chronologically though, it's quite jarring and um, it does make you kind of wonder, like getting another book of hers from the 40s reminds you like, oh, this is like really a better time for her to be writing in terms of setting. Um, so it does, it did kind of make me wonder like maybe she would have been a little more successful these last books if she had sort of like backdated them and kind of set them, uh, you know, 10, 20 years earlier. Before I wrap things up, I just wanted to shout out a few moments that were particularly, I thought, well observed or that I enjoyed. One of which is the, um, <laughs> what I wrote down is the emotional constipation uh, of the scene right before Luttrell accidentally shoots um, his wife, Daisy. I could, like, I delighted in her ability to depict traditional British stuffy emotional constipation in that moment. Like I just, it's the, I, I mean, I'm not British, but from what I know of some of my British friends and just what the general stereotype is, I just felt like she nailed that kind of like a bunch of like kind of fancy guys who are not allowed to talk about their feelings and are feeling so incredibly awkward and just don't know what to do with it. Like I thought she depicted that in an amazing way and that literally made me laugh out loud. I liked uh, the moment when Hastings and Elizabeth Cole are talking. I like them together in general, but, um, and she talks about how these guest houses run by like poor genteel people are houses of failures and how everybody who's there has sort of like failed out of having the life they were supposed to have. And like, while that was an incredibly bleak, way to look at things, I was like, that's a really resonant description. Um, so I thought that was a really a nice observation from Christy. I really enjoyed the entire way she showed and kind of ramped up Hastings having this moment where he thinks he is going to commit murder, like he's planning, to, he plans out a murder and carries it through to the best of his ability. But being Hastings, um, that's not always great. <laughs> and um, so I thought, just as a side note, I thought that was super interesting for her to take us as the reader along with Hastings on that because the, here's this beloved character who 
is doing something that we like is completely out of character for him. But like, I, I felt like she really sold how he got there and like how his sense of like old fashioned honor and whatever, um, would compel him to do this. But, uh, so I thought that whole thing was handled really well. And I liked it as a contrast to when then he later accidentally does kill someone, um, but completely not on his own accord. So I liked kind of the contrast of that. But anyway, I liked how the morning after when he wakes up and realizes that he thought he had killed somebody but failed to, the line is, there's something about writing down an anticlimax in cold blood that is somewhat shattering to one's self-esteem. <laughs> And I just, I, that made me laugh. I love, she shades Hastings all the time in a way that I find very enjoyable. Um, and I enjoy that kind of moment of authorial, uh, you know, gentle ribbing towards one of her characters. So I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that whole interlude and I like that as sort of the, <laughs> the conclusion of it. And then I, I did really like the moment where Hastings, I think that they're in the library and a couple, like one of the men picks up one of the women because um, she's an invalid to go look at the stars and he's he's carrying her outside. And it, it just, it's this little moment and it flashes him back to when he had done something similar with his wife who had passed. And it just, that, that actually made me cry. Um, and Hastings cries and like, he can't even really like confront the fact that he's crying. It's very sad and like, Oh, I wanted to give him a hug. But um, it, it kind of, I think it touched me because it reminded me, like when my dad was sick, part of his his deal is that he his bones are very fragile now. Um, and I remember I had this moment where I realized I was never gonna be able to get like a full hug from him again. And like amid everything else that was happening, that was the moment where like I just lost it. And like, um, that was just so devastating to me, this idea of like, I'm never gonna have like a full like dad hug again. And you know, I'm so thankful that, you know, he made it through and I still have him, you know, hopefully for a long time, we'll see. Um, but anyway, I just, I thought, I thought that was well observed that I think it's like these little moments that really like get you. Do you know what I mean? When you're grieving or when you're going through something, it's not always like, oh, I'm like packing up all their things or whatever, though, of course that's emotional. I think a lot of times it's like the little things. So I thought she, I thought she observed that very well about like what it means to be grieving or going through something hard. And then I just like, I was, so moved and like devastated by once Poro actually dies and like how Hastings talks about it. So he says, I don't want to write about it at all. I want you see to think that about it as little as possible. Hercule Poro was dead and with him died a good part of Arthur Hastings. I will give you the bare facts without embroidery. It is all I can bear to do. <sighs> like I want to cry even <laughs> just reading that because Oh, it's just such a it's such a wonderful observation about friendship and especially somebody who's been so significant in your life and how like um you know, I, I read once that a part of why death and grieving are so hard for us is because when somebody dies, a part of what's dying is our our life with them is dying. So like part, you know, there's many reasons why the death of, for instance, like a parent or a sibling is difficult, but part of it is they're the people who knew you at certain points in your life that like, for instance, your spouse will never have known you during that time unless you grew up together or something. Um, or like your friends don't know that part of you. So like, I, I just like that as like, yeah, like when someone significant in your life dies, a part of you does die in a way because the person who you share that experience with and like hold those memories together with is gone and now you're the only one left holding them. So it's just different. Um, so I thought that was really well. So like, I'm just kind of gushing at this point because I really, I was, I think I was just so pleasantly surprised by this book. I was expecting it to be kind of perfunctory or really weird. And I guess the mystery part is, but there was so much other, th there were so many other things in this book that were interesting to me and touching to me that I was forgiving of the fact that the mystery wasn't necessarily the best. So anyway, I think that's most of what I have to say about this book. I, I'm so glad that I saved it to the very end and that I read it as my last Poirot book. Like, I'm glad I gave myself that experience. I, like I said, was mildly spoiled that I knew he died and knew he died in some way, to, like either suicide or like he gave himself up to like, save Hastings or whatever. Um, so I, I kind of have an idea of that, but um, I, you know, I think it's appropriate that the final book was him dying. Like, I think that that makes sense. Um, I think it was not a perfect ending, but one that was really emotionally satisfying to me. So I think worked ultimately for me. Um, and I definitely, you know, I'm, I think that I would recommend any new reader of Christie save 
this book to the end of their Poirot reading career because I do think that it rewards um, having read all the other ones. If nothing else, just to get kind of the build up to um, to this final one. And you know, it's I say all this, it's interesting because Poirot in a lot of ways isn't in this book all that much. Uh, but in this case, I'm forgiving of it because we are with Hastings. And in a lot of ways, this is really Hastings book. And um, I think the theme of the novel, like I said at the beginning, is Hastings like grieving his wife and moving on and also preparing to let go of Poirot and move on with his life without Poirot. So I guess it worked for me that it wasn't necessarily a super heavy Poirot novel just because I think it worked in terms of like the overall story that was being told and I think what we got of Poirot was very satisfying and I did I liked his like final letter and I felt like that was you know kind of a return to you know the the grand reveal the denou denouement that Christie made so popular you know I kind of liked that we got one last like here's here's how it was done and here are the clues and um and you know I think that touching goodbye from Poro worked for me so um all that to say I'm actually ranking this pretty pretty damn high um put that right here uh I think I mean I would say that I I would I gave this four stars on Goodreads and I would probably put this somewhere around maybe the underdog or yeah somewhere up there I would put this in like my I think this is a really pretty good one um, zone. So maybe towards the bottom of that. I don't know. We'll see where I, I landed here. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I really like this book. I'm a little emotionally wrung out from it though. <laughs> so um, anyway, I will have collected myself by the time you're watching my wrap up, which will go up next week. So um, that that concludes all the new novels. Next week, I'm going to have a wrap up just talking about like, here are the things that I learned doing this reread. Like here are some like, I think I'm going to do like a top 10 takeaway kind of thing. And then the week after that, I'm going to do a video with uh, letting you guys know, now that I've read all the Poirot novels, um, where I would recommend starting with Poirot for, for noobs. Um, so yeah, those will be kind of the end of Project Poirot. One thing to note, I've mentioned this before, but I will say it again, I am gonna do Mission Marple. I wanna give myself a break so, so that I can em embrace that project with enthusiasm and love. Um, because I will tell you, Marple, I just don't like as much as Poirot. I still really enjoy them. Like, don't get me wrong, it's Agatha Christie, I enjoy it. I just don't have the same level of enjoyment or affection maybe for the Marple books. But maybe with time, my opinion has changed. So I'm, I'm willing to uh, amend my, my assessment. Um, but anyway, I wanted to make sure I gave myself enough time to sort of like take a break, have a palate cleanse. So that will be starting in January. I believe I, I have the whole schedule for next year um, for Mission Marple and I'm going to be reading a book every other week because I want to give people anyway I'll give it I'll get into that later but it will start on I believe January 18th with A Murder at the Vicarage next year for Mission Marple. So this is the last of my Christie novels for a while, uh, but I'm excited to have some new ones and I'm excited to wrap this up with a couple more videos. So anyway. With all that being said, if you've made it to this point, congratulations, because I feel like I've been talking for a long time. Hopefully I have edited this to be somewhat coherent, but yeah, I think that will do it. Uh, let me know what you think of this novel in the comments. I assume everybody watching this has read the book. If you haven't, shame on you. I, I really would love you to read this not being spoiled, but you know what, that everybody gets to make their own decisions about that. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that will do it. I will talk to you guys later. Bye.